This is Transition Farm, located on the Mornington Peninsula, two and a quarter acres, that Robin and Pete farm here. Now, 10 years ago, this was nothing but a windswept sand hill with hydrophobic soil, which meant that when you watered, it would literally just run straight off the sandy hill. So here today, we're gonna to speak with Robin and understand a little bit more about her farming principles and how they transformed this property into a thriving CSA for their members of 60 families who will benefit from their incredible commitment to food and, and health. So a plant that is truly allowed to guide its own health um, feeds using soil and sunlight. So um, we've all heard about photosynthesis, but what exactly is photosynthesis? So photosynthesis is when a plant takes in sunlight and carbon dioxide and H2O, water, and using the chlorophyll it has, it breaks apart these molecules to form glucose, which is the building blocks of cells, and, um, and carbon. And a plant that's truly allowed to feed in its own way, in its natural way, will then not only use the glucose to build its own cells, but it'll also excrete these out its roots, drawing to it soil microbes, which break down minerals. And so if the plant is deficient in a mineral, it'll actually change these excretions to draw that soil microbe to it so that it can attain that mineral. If you feed a plant with a water-based fertilizer, whether it's organic or a chemical, you actually override that ability that a plant has to photosynthesize because the plant is drinking in water and the water already has this concoction in it. And that, that concoction is actually transferred as a salt in the plant. And so the more the plant drinks in, the saltier the plant gets. And um, so the plant stops transpiring. So it actually closes its pores to sunlight um, and to air because that makes it more thirsty. And in that process of doing that, it stops photosynthesizing. So it stops producing those, that glucose, which it then you know, uses to um, feed the soil life and also to store carbon in the soil. So really what we're all looking for and what we think we're getting with organic food is food grown in a natural way. But in the current, in the current you know, climate of agriculture, the really only food that's feeding in a natural way is actually biodynamic. So the impulse for biodynamic agriculture came from Rudolf Steiner in the 1920s. And he was asked by farmers to talk to them about how they could bring back the health of their soils and the health of their livestock, which through the advent of chemical agriculture, they were seeing this loss of health. And the reason he agreed to give this lecture was because he felt like there was a real, um, that there was something happening in man, in humans. And what he felt was that they had a lot of thoughts and a lot of wishes or desires, but they weren't able to actually actualize these. Their, their will to do was being thwarted. And he felt it was a direct link to their food. So the food wasn't giving them the proper energy to actually really manifest in their true nature. And so he gave this address to farmers to try and help them remember the way they grew food before you know, the, the advent of chemical agriculture. And, um, and essentially, he was trying to help them enliven the soil. That soil full of life will actually give food that's full of life and food that's really harnessing the power of the sun. So um, in addition to preparations that help enliven the soil and really help plants use, make use of photosynthesizing, um, Rudolf Steiner really just tried to um, invigorate farmers to be builders of health as opposed to cures of sickness. And that's 
that's biodynamics. And um, in the current climate, organic agriculture is really substitution. They can, you know, you can substitute different fertilizers or different sprays, which may be organic in nature, um, to combat different pests and diseases or even to help plants grow. Whereas in biodynamics, we actually try and grow the food for the plants. We're using green manure crops. We're really building the humus layer in the soil. So we're making this strong, this strong system that allows plants to really be in their true nature. And you can see that in the plants, like the plants have a real upright sense. So, and the plants actually follow the sun um, and you, that allow, you know, you can see that they're really, they're really fully being in their plantiness. Well, it's interesting that a hundred years after Rudolf Steiner gave these lectures, now science is finally coming to the, you know, coming to the party. Um, and they've developed this thing called a spectrometer where they're able to measure um, different minerals give back a frequency of light. And so using this spectrometer, they're actually able to measure the difference of the nutrient density of a carrot. So a carrot is no longer a carrot, like not all carrots are the same. And, and, um, and what they're finding is that food grown in this way that's able to mine for its own minerals is actually more nutrient dense. It's able to harness more of the nutrients. And so those are then more accessible to us who eat them. Um, but this nutrient density, it, it has like a life of its own. So once you harvest something, you need careful attention to how you store it and, and how quickly you actually eat it. So things that are um, sugary, like a pea or corn, or even a potato, well, that, that sugar quickly turns as, to starch. And so things, things like corn and peas, you should eat immediately. I mean, in America, they say, don't pick the corn till the water's boiling. So you really need to eat them right away. Um, but if you take care with how you store things, so we quickly try and get the heat out of things, um, and we put it in a cooler to just try and maintain as much of those nutrients as possible. And because our plants aren't water heavy, they actually hold up pretty well um, and retain a lot of their nutrients. But you really should be eating things within a week to 10 days. Well, what they, there was a study done and it was done on beans. Um, and that study showed that actually tinned beans had more nutrient density than beans that were in a grocery store. And the reason was that those beans were harvested and processed in 24 hours to get it into that tin. And that actually preserved the nutrients. Much of the food you're getting at the supermarket has traveled from the farm to the you know wholesale market back to the venue so usually when you, food is there you're getting it five to seven days after it's been harvested um, and that nutrient density starts to drop you know sort of three or four days uh, we have found that our food definitely holds better and keeps its nutrients better um, than a lot of food but you the best thing you could do is actually buy direct from a farmer and that way you know when was this food harvested um, or better yet would be to grow your own and just pick it out of your own garden but um, if you can have that direct contact with who grows your food not only can you ask them how they're growing it um, but you can also know when did they harvest it and that way you're really getting the full nutrients that you that could be available to you so we, um, we try and feed the soil. We don't feed the plant. And so we want the plant to actually have this really nutrient-rich um, humus-based soil. So this where the nutrients are actually held in a stable form um, because water solubles actually wash out and end up in your, in your waterways, contaminating the ocean and things like that. So we use green manure crops you can see some of them have shot back up through our brassicas here. Um, our green manure crops are uh, legumes, 70% legumes, which are nitrogen fixing. 
um, and 30% other things, uh, grains and flowers we use. And we incorporate this into the soil. Before the green manure crop, we might use some rock phosphate or some gypsum just to try and help balance the soil. But basically, we're at the stage now where if our soil is balanced, the, the nutrients available to the plants are actually all there. And the soil, because we have such a diverse soil life, they're all accessible. So um, if our soil life wasn't as diverse, some of those nutrients might not be so accessible. Um, and we do just incorporate that green manure. Sometimes we may feel like we need to add compost. Uh, we make all our compost on the farm and we use biodynamic preparations in that compost. Um, and sometimes we might use horse manure that we get locally. Um, it, but all of that happens usually before the food crop because we really want the food crop accessing that, that humus layer of the soil and feeding from the sunlight itself. Um, and the more plants become mediators between you know the earth and the cosmos through this ability to to feed from sunlight and to leach that out and they take plants that are allowed to really be in their full plantiness they do take the carbon dioxide from the soil and then they put carbon back i mean from the air carbon dioxide from the air and they put carbon back into the soil where it's more stable um, so we want plants to be mediating in this and that's why we try and keep our soil covered all the time either with our crops or with green manures because we really want to keep that soil vibrant and alive and the best way to do that is through through plants feeding the soil life with their sugars oh. For sure, the green manures bring more life to your soil than, than any other thing. And it's not hard to do. Um, many pulse and grain growers will offer you a green manure mix that you can get. Um, I do suggest you try and find organic pulses or organic beans, organic legumes, um, because they're better at harnessing atmospheric nitrogen. Um, a lot of the conventional beans, because they've been fed um, a chemical nitrogen, it's overriding their ability to actually do this amazing thing that they do naturally. So, um, but especially now, it's autumn right now here, um, if you can throw out this green manure and let it grow all winter, you can whippersnip it in the spring and then just gently fork it in. And, um, and that will just start to kickstart your your own soil life in your garden. And it, it, it is, it's the best way to grow food. Legumes, so in, at this time of year, we're putting in fava beans, vetch, clovers, um, dun peas. So those are four very easy to find ones. Um, and then we're also adding oats, ryegrass, um, that mix changes in the spring. We have a, a mix that is better suited for springtime, and then we've got a mix for summer as well. But that's a very, you know, you should be able to very easily find those components. Um, I think the best advice is to build an ecosystem. So we don't see ourselves as farmers of a field. We see ourselves as stewards of this whole ecosystem. And if you get, if you're, if the whole ecosystem is working, some of your quote unquote problems will, the solution actually will exist in the natural system. And, you know, we find that by stewarding an ecosystem, our job as farmers, not using any chemicals, is made much easier. So if you look at your garden as more than just where you grow food, is if, if you look at your garden as everything surrounding your food system and how to nurture that whole system, then you'll have a really healthy system that will help you grow food in a better way.